Welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. When you're ready to launch your next app or want to try a project you hear about on the show, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so take a look at our friends over at Linode. With 200 gigabit private networking, scalable shared block storage, node balancers, and a 40 gigabit public network, all controlled by a brand new API, you've got everything you need to scale up. And for your tasks that need fast computation, such as training machine learning models or building your CI pipeline, they just launched dedicated CPU instances. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash linode, that's L-I-N-O-D-E, today to get a $20 credit and launch a new server in under a minute. And don't forget to thank them for their continued support of this show. And bots and automation are taking over whole categories of online interaction. Discover.bot is an online community designed to serve as a platform-agnostic digital space for bot developers and enthusiasts of all skill levels to learn from one another, share their stories, and move the conversation forward together. They regularly publish guides and resources to help you learn about topics such as bot development, using them for business, and the latest in chatbot news. For newcomers to the space, they have a beginner's guide that will teach you the basics of how bots work, what they can do, and where they are developed and published and to help you choose the right framework and avoid the confusion about which NLU features and platform APIs you will need, they have compiled a list of the major options and how they compare. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash discoverbot today to get started and thank them for their support of the show. And you listen to this show to learn and stay up to date with the ways that Python is being used, including the latest in machine learning and data analysis. For even more opportunities to meet, listen, and learn from your peers, you don't want to miss out on this year's conference season. We have partnered with organizations such as O'Reilly Media, Dataversity, and the Open Data Science Conference. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash conferences to learn more and to take advantage of our partner discounts when you register. And visit the site at pythonpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the newsletter, and read the show notes. And to help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends and coworkers. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Adrian Munich about Indico, the effortless open source tool for event organization, archival, and collaboration. So Adrian, could you start by introducing yourself? Yes, sure. So like you already said, I'm Adrian, well, Adrian actually, since I'm German, uh, 31 years old, writing Python since 2010, been doing quite some programming before as a hobby as well, as a useful thing started with Visual Basic 6, uh, unfortunately lots of PHP as well back then, some C, and yeah, eventually ended up with Python and kind of got stuck with it because it turned out to be my favorite language after I got used to it. And yeah, still doing lots of Python, JavaScript, React, it's useful things people like to work with nowadays, I would say. Do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? Yes, I actually do. That was early 2010. Uh, I'm uh, in the IRC network uh, game search, which back then, I'm in the IRC network game search, which back then was actually a bit bigger. And I was doing some development there, and there was the idea to rewrite the website, which was a very old PHP site back then. So uh, the guy who was leading it uh, really liked Python. So we actually used Python and Tornado for it, which, I mean, in my opinion on Tornado nowadays is um, not so great, but okay, it was a long time ago and first touch with the Python back then like this. And yeah, you know, so I started learning Python, doing a bit with it, kind of liked it, well, besides the framework and not being that used to it so far. And yeah, in the end, the timing with this was actually perfect because I was about to finish my bachelor's degree back then and ended up uh, sending an application to CERN for doing my bachelor project. And in the end, I was hired to join the Indico team for a year in 2011, which I think was actually because I had Python skills by then. And so are you still working with that same team? Yes. I mean, there's lots of fluctuation in the team simply because most of the contracts at CERN are short term. So I think, yeah, basically me and uh, one other person who's on long-term contracts now are still the same as initially, but everybody else changed since then. I mean, I also had a break when I was doing my master. Yeah, it's basically the only team I worked in so far. 
my only professional experience is actually working on Indico, but there's so much different things to do. So I wouldn't want it any way else, to be honest. <laughs> it's definitely a lucky break to be able to get involved so early on with a project that's been able to turn out to be your career to date. So <laughs> congratulations on that front. And I'm wondering if you can talk a bit more about what the Indigo project is and how it got started and uh, sort of what stage it was in when you first got involved with it. Yeah, sure. Actually, Indico Project is uh, started quite a bit earlier before I started programming, well, started programming professionally because this project started, let me check again, in 2002. So back when I was 14, I think it was around the time where I started doing some Visual Basic and PHP actually as a hobby. But back then this project started as a European project. It was basically a collaboration between CERN, uh, another research institute and uh, some universities. And, and now I'm going to quote from the old project description. Its main objective was to create a web-based multi-platform conference storage and management system, which would allow storage of documents and metadata related to real events. Back then it was an acronym for integrated digital conferencing. And uh, two years after that, 2004, Indico actually uh, went live for production usage at CERN for a uh, conference in high energy physics called CHEP, which is computing in high energy physics. So back then, Indico was focused on actual organizing conferences. But then over the next three years, the team added support for meeting and lecture type events, added room booking functionality, then later, some collaboration tools like integration with video conferencing systems. And the, pro and the project was constantly growing, mostly because of the extensive use at CERN itself. And then the most interesting part, 2014, that's actually when I came back to the project after a break, when the development on version 2 started, which was uh, basically a 98% rewrite of the code base, since it uh, got kind of old by then, but more about that later. And yeah, 2017, then we finally released Indico 2.0, based on modern technology. So yes, that's actually pretty much the whole history of Indico. Yeah, I was going to ask you about how you've managed to keep the code maintainable and up to date given the length of time that it's been around for. But if you did a major rewrite around the version two timeframe, I can see how that would help with trying to modernize it and bring it up to date with current paradigms and tooling. So I'm curious if in that process you brought it up to Python 3 compatibility and some of the other major changes that were necessary in that process of upgrading it for the 2.0 release. So indeed, 2.0 was, was a major rewrite, like I said, 98 or 99 percent of the code we written, as, uh, both uh, back end and front end, just a few things remaining, uh, which we hope to tackle soon. So for example, uh, in 2.0, we completely switched databases because before it was using ZODB, a Python-based object database. And then we switched to Postgres using SQL Alchemy. Uh, 2013, we switched to, from a homemade WFGI framework to Flask. We switched template engines twice. I think it was 2011 where we switched from something homemade to Marco. And then during the rewrite from Marco to Ginger, Python 3, unfortunately not yet, but it's certainly we want to do. Ideally, then with Indico version 3, because it's a great opportunity to bump the major version number again. Also, it's hard to resist the temptation to have version 3 for Python 3. Fun fact, just a few weeks ago, I actually uh, tried uh, running Indico on the Python 3 locally, not even using 2 to 3 or anything, just editing a few places where things failed. And at least getting the base very basic thing running was pretty straightforward. So I think we don't have any major hurdles going to Python 3 eventually. And so, as you said, Indico is a tool for being able to manage events and booking resources and being able to track various assets that are associated with those events. So I'm curious, what are some of the other projects that are operating in a similar space and what the current state of the landscape was when Indico was first being created that made it necessary to build it in-house? Uh, when Indico was being created, I have to admit that's a bit before my time. Back then, I had nothing to do with conference management. Like I said, I was 14 back then. Uh, I think there were no real good alternatives. 
I mean, I know that, for example, for meetings at CERN, there was another tool called CDS Agenda, which was actually used, I think, since 1999. But that was mostly for lectures and meetings, written in PHP, actually. It was kind of the ancestor of Indica. But on the market, if there was anything commercial available back then, I don't think so. But I have to admit, I never researched uh, things that much in the past. And so... For somebody who's looking to manage an event, even just as small as a meeting, but potentially as large as a conference, I'm wondering if you can just talk through the workflow of how they would go about setting it up and managing the event over its entire life cycle using Indico. So it actually depends on whether you already have an Indico instance where you have access or not, because uh, the most common use case of Indico is actually to have it as a repository of events. So it's not as much focused on organizing a single event like some of the other commercial tools available nowadays, where you really run one single conference with it. But basically repository where you can have hundreds, thousands or even hundreds, thousands of events, depending on how big you are. So assuming you already have Indico installed, it's literally just a few clicks. Usually you pick a category. You click create event, enter a few basic information like a title and a time and date. And that's it. Then you actually have your event, which you can then configure further. And so you're saying that it's primarily used as an archive of what happened during the event and some of the presentation materials, but can it also be used as sort of the organizational platform for people who are collaborating to try and get everything set up, for instance, something like PyCon or the high energy physics conference that you were mentioning? The Indico covers basically the whole life cycle of a conference. So it's, I mean, it starts when you create an event as a conference. You have a well, somewhat basic conference website, which you could actually style with custom CSS to make it look prettier. For scientific, especially for scientific conferences, you can set up like the scientific program of the conference with different tracks. You can run a call for abstracts, which for those who don't know what that is because they don't organize conferences, that's basically when you are asking for ideas on talks and maybe posters, well, all kinds of contributions, basically. Then if you did this and people submitted their proposals, you can actually do a reviewing process on it, either with separate reviewers and judges or, judge or only judges. Like this, you can have a group of people actually select which proposals they actually want in the conference and which they don't. Maybe changing the type if you decide, for example, hey, this sounds interesting, but maybe too much for a presentation. We'll just do it as a poster. Then when you have decided on which contributions you actually want, you can use Indico to organize a timetable or agenda of the event. We actually arrange everything, like when it happens, maybe group it in sessions, decide what's parallel, or if you have a plenary session. There's actually a graphic viewer in Indico where you can see what's happening when. Interesting fact, this is one of the few places where the front end is very much legacy. Hopefully we can rewrite that in React at some point. Then another important feature for, I guess, many conferences is the registration. So in Indico, you can configure a registration form with custom fields and everything. Hopefully at some point, even with like conditional fields where you can select something or have to select something depending on what you else you selected. But right now, it's really only asking the user to enter data. But for most conferences, actually enough, at least in our case. You can connect this to a payment system. For example, we have plugins for PayPal, and somebody actually contributed a plugin to integrate with Stripe and FixPay. So if you install one of those plugins, you can actually uh, uh, quickly let people pay by credit card or PayPal uh, for the event. Then, what you actually mentioned before, uploading materials such as slides. That's something you can do as soon as you are uh, an author or speaker for a given contribution. Then by default, you have access to upload materials for it. can be any file. Usually it's PDFs or PowerPoint presentation. Again, since we support plugins, somebody could have a plugin that automatically converts the PDF to PowerPoint. That's something we do, for example, at CERN. We have a custom plugin for this. It's interacting with another service we have here where if you upload Word or well, Office files in general, by default, it will be converted to PDF. 
Then after the conference itself, at least for scientific conferences, it's somewhat common that people submit the paper then related to the talk. If you enable that feature, you can actually do another reviewing process for this one. And at any time in the conference lifecycle, you could run a survey, either anonymous or requiring login and knowing who answered what. So yeah, in the end, it covers really uh, basically all conference features that uh, people in the um, high energy physics community considered useful enough to ask for it and we considered useful enough to implement them. In particular, I really like the fact that it uh, that it offers a single repository for all of the different materials related to a given talk because there have been a number of times where I've gone to conferences and there's just usually not any well thought out way of being able to collect all of the slides and other presentation materials for people to be able to refer to after the fact. And so usually it's maybe one person sends it out on Twitter, one person has a link in their slides that you have to try and remember. And, you know, there might be an email that goes out afterwards or somebody might collect everything after the fact, but having it be part of the overall planning process and something that's easily centralized and easy for all the attendees to access definitely seems to make a lot of sense. Indeed. That's actually one of the things we mentioned in the introduction video we have on our website, which is basically giving a very high level overview about why Indico is useful. Another example we have there why it's useful is you come to a meeting room, you figure out, oh, my laptop doesn't have the necessary connector to actually connect to the projector. So, so one of the use cases is that if you have a computer in the meeting room and uh, log into Indico, you can access anything, uh, any slides, etc. you need from there without having to connect your own laptop. Of course, reality is a bit different because then you might use something fancy like Reveal JS for your presentation and end up with a conference room that only has Internet Explorer installed. So in the end, you connect your laptop anyway. But still, by uploading the presentation or at least the PDF version of it to Indico, like you said, it's being archived. So even if you don't use Indico to present it yourself, uh, anybody can still download it from Indico later. And so can you talk a bit through how Indico itself is architected and some of the ways that it has evolved since you first began working on it? I actually, I just noticed one interesting fact from the previous one I forgot to mention. That actually uh, one of the first conferences, I think it was ID60 something that was organized with the Indico instance at CERN, was Europeize in 2006 which I think actually took place at CERN back then. So Indico was already kind of related to the Python community that many years ago. That's cool. So, yeah. And so can you talk through a bit about how Indico itself is architected and some of the ways that the architecture and design of the project has evolved since you first began working on it? Yes. So let me maybe start with the architecture we had in Legacy Indico 1. So back then, initially we were actually using mod Python. So basically PY files using very, containing very short functions, calling into different layer. Then eventually when we added WFGI, back then also using a homemade WFGI layer because you didn't have Flask or anything like this at this point. And I think, uh, not sure if Django existed back then. I don't think so, to be honest. Maybe there was SOAP because that ODB existed obviously back then. But, but I don't think that was, would have been a good choice since I, from what I heard, the SOAP-based frameworks were quite heavyweight. Anyway, uh, coming from the more Python-like layer, she's called into the next layer called the RH layer, standing for request handler. She's basically implemented the business logic. From there, we had two more layers. Uh, first one was called the WP layer, standing for web page. And if I remember correctly, this was basically then converting whatever database objects we had uh, to a new structure, like a dictionary or some arguments to pass along uh, used for displaying. And then, because with the original architecture, we didn't have any nice template engine, uh, initially not even support to have any conditionals in templates. It was then calling uh, the W classes, which stood for, I guess, for web, which was basically then converting whatever view data you had 
to actually data pass to the template. And let's uh, forget all the Stone Age style structure and go to what we have nowadays. So now, I mean, in terms of project structure, it's still a bit similar because when we were writing it, we were actually doing it uh, part by part. So we didn't do any major changes in, uh, for example, replacing everything with simple view function like you usually do in Flask. So coming from the Flask app, we have lots of different blueprints as usual. Instead of registering normal functions, we were registering our RH classes, which we had before, except now they're much more lightweight. In those functions, we still do pretty much all the business logic. But from there, we directly call through a very thin wrapper from the old WP system, which only adds, for example, the HTML structure around it because it would have been a bit uh, too complex to actually replace everything with Ginger inheritance during the rewrite, especially because it was partially initially. But yeah, from the RH class, it's basically calling to something roughly equivalent to Flask's render template. And that's it, basically. Uh, one of the things we do on the RH level as well is handling errors and doing automatically uh, doing an, something else we do in the I, sorry, something else we do in the RH class besides uh, things like error handling and some basic logging is uh, handling database commits, which was mostly uh, because in the past when we were using ZODB, uh, we had to somehow uh, sometimes retry a request. Maybe I can talk about this one a bit later when we come to the interesting parts because ZLDB had a few particularities that were, well, not what you're used to if you do SQL, et cetera, nowadays. Yeah, I've uh, had the dubious pleasure of dealing with the uh, ZODB system and some of the interesting ways that they have approached the entire idea of what a database is and could be. Sounds like you had about as much fun as it is as us. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually still currently maintaining a project that relies on it. I mean, I'm sure ZODB has its places, and I guess for prototyping initially it was very convenient. But in the end, when you grow, when you have a ZODB set, I think the uh, data FS file was around 40 gigabytes on disk eventually for the CERN Indico instance. Yeah, I've got a project that I'm maintaining right now where I think we're running about a 60 gigabyte ZODB database, and it's uh, it's, it's fun when it gets corrupted and you have to, you have to try and figure out a way to repair it. <laughs> Luckily, I never had to do that. I think there was maybe I think from I think I remember there was like one case where something in the database got corrupted, but I don't remember how exactly it was fixed because I think it was before I joined the team. But as far as I know, even with a ZODB having sometimes some corruption. In all the 17 years now of the project, we didn't have any single actual data loss, unless you count people accidentally deleting things they didn't intend to delete. <laughs> but well, that's a layer 8 problem, so I wouldn't blame the product for it <laughs> or the database. And so can you talk about some of the more interesting or complex or challenging aspects of working on Indico, both from the point of view of the technical implementation, as far as what was difficult to manage, and also from the perspective of the uh, business logic and the use case, as far as just understanding what is necessary to be able to manage some of these large events with all of these different resource allocation problems and just trying to figure out how to represent that in code? Yes. Actually, in terms of uh, non-technical, sometimes the biggest use, uh, the biggest, most, in terms of non-technical things, the most interesting uh, thing is probably how people use the system in, let's say, unexpected ways. For example, let's take abstract reviewing. We have a very nice timeline, which totally doesn't look similar to the timeline of the GitHub pull request. And of course, then you have people who are asking, hmm, how can I print the list of abstracts with all the details? Because yes, you have people who are used to taking the list of abstracts, printing it, getting a meeting room, hopefully through Indico, then sitting together, using uh, not a pen, maybe some papers, and doing the reviewing offline. Even so, we have a very pretty user interface where you can do the reviewing directly in Indico. So, of course, then we had to ensure that all the PDF exports we had for this area, well, 
said it looked nice. It was nice to print. <laughs> and then uh, coming to more technical things, I would say uh, uh, some, one of the most complex parts is actually protection. Because I mean, even so, for example, in case of CERN, we are very open. So actually many meetings and lectures where the slides and details are completely public, even to people outside CERN. But of course, we have our also meetings, let's say HR or even uh, other internal things. I mean, even our team meetings, I mean, they usually don't contain anything completely private, but I mean, it's a meeting among the team. You, may, you don't want those fully public. So Indico provides a nested uh, protection schema. Basically, each category can have, be either public, protected, or inheriting, unless it's a root category, which has nothing to inherit from, of course. So if you, let's say, uh, go into a category a few, le uh, few levels deep, and you have inheriting parents, you have to actually climb up the chain until you find the category where you're not inheriting anymore and then do the access check there. Sounds easy. Well, let's assume you are, uh, have 50 levels of category nesting, which luckily we don't. But yeah, you have to climb up 50 levels uh, up. And at least with standard SQL alchemy, that would usually mean 50 queries for every, every time you load a page where this kind of access needs to be checked. So for this, uh, we ha actually had to do some F nice SQL where we got lucky that uh, quite early in the rewrite project, we decided to only support Postgres. And let me tell you one thing, recursive CTEs are a very, very amazing thing in Postgres because that, thing, that way you can basically do all the climbing up in a single SQL query and in the end, for example, it returns this idea of the category, the first one is not inheriting, or you could, uh, what else are we, let me think. Yeah, I think that's the most interesting part. We actually have a few more CTEs, for example, to get uh, nested event counts for categories, including subcategories. I would call it dark SQL magic, but I have to say I had lots of fun implementing it. The other way around, something else uh, we did is uh, if you have an event that's, let's say, public or protected, it might have parts inside that have a different protection level. Yeah, it's always fun trying to figure your way through a naughty problem like that where you have to pick apart all of the different dependencies and figure out how to turn this complex piece of business logic into something that's tractable and that you can actually implement in the code in a manner that's able to be reasoned about without turning it into <laughs> essentially a, a mirror image of the real world problem case. <laughs> Indeed. That was actually also interesting the first time we were writing the room booking system during the 2.0 rewrite because this one, while the core was using ZODB, had at least in theory support for different types of databases. So basically there was another abstraction layer, which was then always calling a ZODB layer again. But with this abstraction layer and the ability to use separate ZODB for it, it was even more complexity. So, yeah, when we're writing this one, we also had to deal with uh, getting rid of this extra abstraction. And, yeah, actually, room booking is the one thing we actually rewrote again with the version we're currently working on, because that one is actually now a React application inside Indico. And so for things like the room booking or ensuring that there is access to the necessary resources for a given presentation, and also in terms of ensuring that all of the different participants are able to be free within a particular time frame, I'm wondering how you approach the business logic of being able to manage all of those constraints and resolve them to a single time frame where everything is available and everything is accessible? Actually, currently the answer is we don't because the only part where we do this kind something like resolving uh, things is in for the front end in the timetable to actually show a parallel session in a nice way. But I don't think that's uh, exactly what you mean. I think what you meant is more something like like what you do with Doodle nowadays to find the time for your event. 
So currently in Indico, when you create an event, you already have to know a time and date. You can change it later, but we don't have any way right now to use Indico to find the time where people are available. Interesting fact, this might actually change uh, in the medium term, because at CERN, we are currently looking into options to find good alternatives to things like Outlook or Doodle. So what they're actually considering is to have Doodle-like functionality, like Doodle on steroids, because it would be able to access, for example, the calendar of people. And then you could uh, do something where you select the list of people, usually maybe from an LDAP database or whatever other database you have. Then maybe provide some possible dates which you, which you are available in and immediately see uh, how good those options are for your participants. And then eventually, when you decided on a date based on that or got responses from people like a Doodle, then you could decide on a date and actually create the event from it. But to be honest, not completely sure if that would actually become a part of Indico, maybe a plugin, maybe a standalone application only using the Indico API, because in the end, its functionality is that's great to organize an event. But not only for that, you could use the same thing completely without Indico if you just want the self-hosted Doodle, for example. Okay, and another case uh, is a new room booking system. Because especially if you have meeting rooms at your organization, chances are good it might be hard to find one at the particular slot you're interested in. Especially if you have a building with lots of people and only one meeting room in that actual building. Because of course people like staying in their own building for a meeting, maybe just going downstairs. At least uh, our team really likes that. So you might notice, oh, hmm, where do I do my meeting now? Usually it's from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. So let's find a room for it. Ideally, uh, this one, hmm, not available. But what we do in the new room booking, we actually look for alternatives. So basically, we try uh, to see if we can shift the meeting a bit, start a bit earlier, make it a bit shorter, or for multi-day meetings, maybe skip a day. And in that case, we offer the room you were originally interested in with some minor changes. And another area of complexity that often comes up, particularly when you're trying to deal with anything that has to do with time, is the issue of time zones. So I'm wondering how you've approached that problem in Indico, given that one of the core pieces of functionality is around this scheduling component. Yes, another part that can be very fun from time to time to deal with especially if you include daylight saving time. Well, luckily, apparently, we are getting rid of it in the European Union, but, well, still something you have to keep in mind because there will always be uh, countries with, with DST. Anyway, so basically, Indico has a default time zone, which in most cases basically is the time zone of whoever's hosting it. Then in each category, you can set a time zone and uh, on event as well. So when you're viewing an event as a user for any of the public areas of the event, by default, you have the time zone of the event for everything that's displayed, but you can change it to, for example, see everything in your own time zone. Then when managing an event, we always show it in the time zone selected for the event, simply to avoid any confusions if you have multiple people organizing the event and then somebody would see a different time. That would be uh, basically uh, chaos. The really tricky part with time zones is uh, displaying information. Let's say you have a conference that runs from 9 in the morning to 8 in the evening. That's great. You see everything on one day. Suddenly, you have somebody who is in a time zone that's, let's say, six hours later. So suddenly, this person looks at the timetable and at least at some point during development, what happened was basically an error because suddenly you had uh, things that used to be on the same day suddenly on a different day. So the tricky thing there is to really make sure that time zone is always converted properly. Calculations are either done in the time zone or in UTC, but never in a mix of both. So time zone handling is one of the things I personally, uh, let's say, hate. <laughs> because, I mean, I, I consider myself smart, but imagining time zones and so things, uh, I just don't like it. <laughs> Luckily, I think we got rid of most of the issues related to it by now. 
I think if anybody says that they enjoy working with time zones, then they should probably have their head checked. Well, I think enjoying to work with time zones would be rule 34 material. <laughs> And another area that's often challenging to work with is that given the level of flexibility and configurability for Indico, it's often a problematic for users who are first getting started with it to be able to make sense of the system. And so it can often be something that will turn them away from trying to work with it. So I'm curious how you approach managing sane defaults for the system to make it so that users who are first getting started have an easy onboarding experience and then just dig into the more complex aspects of it as they need to. So if uh, you start with somebody who doesn't have an Indico instance yet, we actually have a step-by-step -step setup guide for Debian, Ubuntu, uh, CentOS, both one for Nginx and Apache. So you Theoretically, somebody with almost no Linux knowledge could follow this one to have a secure setup of his own Indico instance. Of course, would have to take care about updates and the usual things. So personally, I don't think somebody who uh, doesn't know how to uh, manage Linux should be running the server uh, himself with Indico. But if you have, for example, somebody doing IT, you can easily have somebody go through the install guide and set up an Indico instance. Anyway, I guess you mostly meant this question about actual users using Indico. So feel free to skip the first part if you prefer to. So uh, as a new user in Indico, it depends, of course, what you want to do. While Indico does offer lots of functionality, especially the basic things are pretty much self-explaining. And advanced features like abstracts or paper are actually uh, disabled by default. Also, we have a user guide, which is nowadays linked in the footer of each Indico page. And this guide not only explains uh, the basic concepts, but also has a bunch of training videos uh, explaining things more in depth. And this guide is actually hosted on GitHub. So if anybody is trying out Indico now and missing something, pull request welcome. And then, of course, if you're using Indico in a bigger organization, maybe uh, you have somebody providing training. For example, that's what we do at CERN. A few times per year, uh, one or two of the developers actually do uh, two half-day training sessions uh, showing uh, uh, the most important features to people who either never used Indico or never used it to organize conferences with it. But, of course, ideally, we want Indico to be so straightforward, so there's uh, much less need for this kind of training. But of course, with something like Indico, of course, you have lots of different users. You have technical people, but organizing conferences is, of course, often done by the secretariat. So, of course, you have people who are not that much used to using web apps that are not super uh, modern. I mean, pretty much everybody is using Facebook nowadays. So ideally, we have a UI that's as easy to use as any of the uh, big uh, web apps nowadays. But I think uh, it's hard to compare something like Twitter or Facebook with something like Indico, simply because we provide so much more functionality compared to something rather specific. So I guess it's always that there are some uh, things people need to get used to. And as far as ensuring that you are shipping usable code, there's always the issue around testing. And given the level of complexity of Indico, I imagine that a fair amount of that requires some extensive integration tests. So I'm wondering if you can just talk a bit about the overall approach that you're using to make sure that you're testing the at least critical pieces of Indico and some of the challenges that you faced on that front. So you already mentioned it, uh, critical pieces. We actually tried at one point, which was uh, room booking for 2.0, to basically cover every single function with the test. It, in the end, it turned out to be way too much work for little benefit. So what we're doing now is uh, unit tests for critical parts. Our areas, we know is that they're going to have uh, strange edge cases. So for this, we have tests uh, using PyTest. And for now, it's pretty much only unit tests. In the past, at some point, we used to have some Selenium tests as well. But we got rid of those since they weren't really maintainable. And uh, I don't think we ever really found issues with those tests. But the unit tests, at least in the area where we have those, are quite helpful. I think ideally we would have more tests, but as you probably know, 
reality uh, strikes and there's so many things that should need to be done. So in the end, uh, there's not really a time to write tests for everything. So yeah, like I said, we focus on critical parts, on edge cases. And yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of testing, at least the technical kind of testing. I uh, think uh, our in own Indico instance is basically the biggest one out there. We have one big advantage. We have users who are very good test runners. To say. So if we deploy a new version, nowadays everything actually goes pretty well. Back in the ZODB era, of course, there was much more to fix usually after new release. But nowadays, of course, users find some issues, but it's usually only a few minor things. But it's still amazing to have that many users because like this, no matter how many unit tests you have, users are going to find some bugs. <laughs> yeah, they're often quite good at that. I mean, companies like Facebook do it. They add new features, so maybe, if, okay, if they use do A-B testing, which is something we don't. But in the end, those companies, they use users as testers even more, sometimes even with new UI, which turns out to be awful in some cases. I mean, we don't do that because we like our users. <laughs> we sometimes do usability tests for some things. For example, for new room booking, we invited uh, various people, some IT persons, some power users, some secretaries. So we actually let them do some steps with the new UI, then uh, had a look what they were doing, where they got stuck, what they liked, what they disliked. This was quite pretty helpful for doing the UI development. So like this, we got feedback earlier, which of course has advantage that those people then can't really complain if they decide they don't like the UI in the end because they had the chance to give feedback. But uh, set aside, of course, it's extremely valuable to get this kind of feedback earlier when it's still easy to change things and not shortly after a release because nothing more annoying that you release an amazing new version and then you, your users tell you, hey, but this uh, workflow we use all the time doesn't work. So how can we do this now? And then you end up having to implement things on very short notice. And you mentioned earlier, too, that Indico has a plugin system. So I'm curious if you can talk about some examples of plugins that you have written or that you have used or some of the more interesting or unexpected ways that people have integrated with Indico. Yes. Speaking of the plugin system, that's a Flask extension we developed called Flask Plugin Engine. Unfortunately, not too much documentation yet, but again, contributions welcome. Feel free to try it out. And uh, plugins, we actually have quite a few. Most of them are actually developed by us. Interesting ones, let's see. I mean, uh, we have a bunch of plugins uh, useful to the general public. I would say the most useful one nowadays would probably be the S3 storage. In terms of uh, really weird things or funny plugins, there's nothing I can imagine in this area. I mean, it's mostly plugins that are actually useful for certain cases. Like we have a plugin integrating with PayPal, uh, one to preview code with highlighting or even Jupyter notes. Notebooks. And I would say in terms of interesting plugins is actually the plugins that are used for certain specific use cases. So those plugins are also public on GitHub simply to provide uh, examples of more complex plugins. So for example, we have one plugin that's actually used to grant guests access to the site of our organization. Or is it one plugin that's actually used to grant visitor site access to the CERN? So there's one plugin we have that's actually used to a print visitor passes so people can get on the CERN site without being employees. So for this plugin, basically we're hooking into the registration process of Indico and the event manager then has the ability to select, yes, I want to give these people access. Then it automatically calls an API uh, or the access control team. It generates a QR code and then people can print it and use this to get on site. So, and actually, I mean, that's not a plugin yet, but we have one other big user of Indico, and that's the United Nations, who are actually using this as a primary way also to grant access to people to get on site for conferences they organize. And there's one plugin I really have to mention because that's actually our April Fool's joke we did this year. It's based on the new room booking system we did, uh, allowed people to reserve showers at CERN. And since we were talking about testing before, it was a really great and fun way to actually get some real users using a new system without uh, any uh, real value. And we had it running for one day and we had around 1,000 people who actually created an account in this new system and quite a few were 
booking showers in the system, usually with a funny message. But in the end, it was uh, provided testers. It was a funny thing to do. And it didn't even take much time because of how flexible things are in Indico nowadays. And you mentioned that one of the notable users of Indico is the United Nations. I'm wondering if there are any other interesting or notable ways that Indico has been used either for different organizations or for specific conferences or events that you're aware of? Uh, one interesting event, I think it's some Linux, I think it's called Linux Plumbers Conference or something like that. And I think uh, OpenSUSE was using it at some point for a conference they were organizing. And what's quite interesting is that we've seen quite a few religious groups from Africa using Indico to organize uh, some pastor congresses or something like that, which is something at least I would have never expected, that you actually have somebody using Indico to organize religious events. Another fun use case that was actually on the CERN Indico instance, somebody was using an Indico event in our test category uh, to invite people to his wedding. <laughs> So yeah, people find interesting use cases for it. Unfortunately, that event was in the test category, so eventually it got deleted when we started automatically killing it up. But it was still uh, nice to see what people end up doing with Indica. Yeah, as I was reading through the documentation and looking at the feature set, it definitely seems like it's flexible enough to be able to use for all kinds of different use cases. I was even envisioning maybe using it for like family planning needs of figuring out, uh, you know, if you have a one-car household and you have two two or three different kids and they all need to be at different events at different times trying to figure out how to book everything to make sure that you can get to the different places at the right times with the right people. Ah, okay. Because I was actually thinking with, uh, that we could actually integrate with a calendar, which is something we do with a custom plugin as well at CERN to add events you're attending to people's Outlook calendar. So yeah, you could actually then uh, have a look at what events you're attending in, in, through Indico and uh, maybe uh, overlay it with your personal calendar if you have a calendaring tool supporting it. And this doodle-like thing we might do at some point in the future could also be something which you then somehow combine with your personal calendar to get an overview of both personal and work-related events. So I think there's lots of potential in this area. Yeah, it's definitely a pretty interesting tool. And I know a couple of people who are involved in organizing different conferences or events. So it's something that I've been planning on uh, mentioning to them as a potential way to simplify some of the overall process of trying to get things lined up. And so what have been some of the most interesting or unexpected or challenging lessons that you've learned in the process of building and maintaining Indico? I think the main point is that dealing with legacy data really, really sucks. Uh, especially if this data you have is actually inconsistent, which unfortunately with a database like ZODB is very likely. Because if you don't know ZODB, it's, I think I'm not sure who started calling it like this, but I remember seeing somewhere the term a glorified pickle store. Because yes, in the end, you have classes, dictionaries, and lists in it. So no schema or anything. So you might end up having older things in the database using uh, this structure, then something new suddenly instead of a string somewhere, you have a dictionary or another class. So even if you just want to go over this data to import it to your Postgres database, it's not fun dealing with all those cases, especially if your database is big enough, surrounding the migration takes a few hours in total. And, uh, but uh, this thing showed one thing, it's really important to uh, be, make sure your data is consistent. For example, you really don't want uh, an event set of contributions that are starting after the event actually ended. Because imagine you're drawing the timetable based on the start and end time of the event, and then you suddenly have a contribution outside. So as if for this, we actually added some uh, constraints as trigger functions in, uh, in Postgres SQL to actually ensure that this never happens. And what are some of the features or improvements or overall bug fixes that you have planned for the future of the project? Well, m one thing, of course, is Python 3 support. Well, actually, it will probably be more switching to Python 3. 
since I think for a project like Indico, there's no not that much value in supporting both Python 2 and 3 at the same time. Because with Indico 3, that would be a major release. It would be a clean cut where we would tell people, okay, time to delete your virtual ends, time to upgrade your Linux distribution to the latest supported one, time to uh, make sure you have Python 3.6 because I don't think we're going to support anything lower. Well, maybe 3.5. Uh, we have to see when we actually switch what's the right um, a mainstream support. But personally, I can say I really want F-strings in whatever Python 3 versions we're going to support. That's one of the things I really like in Python 3 when using it for my own things. So I think it would be a shame to support an older Python 3 version because I'm pretty sure whatever Python 3 version we pick for Indico 3 is going to stay supported for a very long time. So besides Python 3 support, of course, eradicating uh, the remaining bits of legacy code, like some parts in the front end, or a few bits of Python code that are still legacy. I think we even have some code remaining that's using CamelCalf. That's something I really want uh, to change. Not in not too far in the future. Then uh, front end wise, uh, having more reactive stuff because we started using React uh, for things like room booking about a year ago, and everyone in the team really likes it. It's actually quite uh, bad now for any of us if we have to go back maintaining the old jQuery based thing sometimes. So if, especially for management areas, we really want to do more uh, React which also means that things are going to be more restful, which is great uh, for creating APIs. And that's actually the last thing I got to mention here. It's actually a GitHub issue I created before we released 2.0 to improve the API a bit, also how authentication is done. For example, I really like how GitHub is doing it, like being able to create uh, tokens or using OAuth, depending on your use cases. So that's something I really want to see happen at some point. Not sure when we have the time for it. Hopefully we have it at some point. And besides that, it really depends on uh, use cases uh, at CERN, since in the end CERN is the main uh, uh, developer of Indico. I mean, we of course have external contributors, where most of the development is happening at CERN. But I have to say, contributions are always very welcome. And yeah, if you have any great idea for things to improve in Indico, let us know. Well, for anybody who does want to get in touch with you, either to add suggestions or provide feedback or to follow along with the work that you're doing, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And with that, I'll move us into the picks. And this week, I'm going to choose the movie Mortal Engines that I watched recently. Uh, it was very interesting, very uh, visually appealing, a lot of different actors than you're used to in sort of the big blockbuster movie. So it was a lot of fun to watch. I uh, definitely recommend that for anybody who's looking for something sort of uh, fantastical and visually appealing. And so with that, I'll pass it to you, Adrian. Do you have any picks this week? Oh, that's actually a good question. I have to admit, when it comes to movies, it's usually uh, the typical superhero movie, since it's all usually fun to watch. We very recently, I had the chance to try out a virtual reality headset at a friend's place, and I have to say, it's really fun. So if you have the opportunity, try it out. Portal is fun, but Portal in VR, I would say, is even more fun. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today to join me and discuss the work that you've been doing with Indico. It's definitely a very interesting platform and one that seems to have a lot of potential utility. Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing how you do with the 3.0 release. And so with that, I want to thank you again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for the interview. It was quite interesting to talk about Indico. And uh, one thing I have to say, if anybody's interested, feel free to pass by our IRC channel uh, called Indico on Freenode. All the developers are there. I think it's the best place to reach us.